Amen. All right, now we started off reading Proverbs 5. Keep a notebook, uh, uh, some kind of a finger here or, or the bulletin or something because we're going to come back to this. Turn, if you would, to 2 Samuel chapter 12. Um, obviously, we're still continuing our series on the Ten Commandments. And tonight we're going to um, cover the commandment of not committing adultery. And this sermon really can be considered an extension of this morning's sermon. This morning was not bearing false witness, not lying. Well, inherently with committing the sin of adultery, and just, just to clear up adultery in case anyone doesn't know, adultery is the sin that's committed when you're married and you have the same relation that you would have with your wife or your husband with somebody else. That's what adultery is. Now the Bible talk has, has two um, words that it uses. It uses fornication, it uses adultery. Adultery is the one when you're married and you commit that act. Fornication is something that's done when you're not married, and that'll be important a little bit later. But adultery is when you betray your wife or betray your husband and go and embrace the arms of another man or woman that's not your husband or your wife. And um, that's what we're going to be preaching about this morning. Now, this, I can't stand this. This is probably, in my opinion, one of the worst sins that a person can commit just of all time in the Bible. This is one of the worst. At least, it's definitely, I would say, the worst between people. I mean, I think that, you know, blaspheming the Holy Ghost is worse. There are certain sins that are, are specifically, completely against God specifically that, that I would say are probably worse because this is against your spouse, another person. But apart from that, I mean, when, when we're grouping sins together, this is probably one of the worst things that you can do to another person is commit adultery. When you, when you have that type of, like, I would rather be physically assaulted. I would rather deal with, with someone, you know, losing a limb. I would rather deal with, with any type of, of pain or discomfort in that sense than the pain that I would receive from my wife committing adultery on me. That is one of the most hurtful things that anybody can do to another person. I mean, think about it. You choose a person out. When you get married, you decide, you make a vow, and you say, you, you vow to each other in saying that we are going to stick together. You and I, we're in this together. We're going to have good times. We're going to have bad times. But no matter what, you and I are going to stick together, and it's us two, and you two join together and become one flesh. You become one. And when you commit adultery, you are dividing yourself and cleaving on to somebody else that's not your spouse and completely destroying the trust, the, the relationship, and, and everything that goes along with it. it it's, it's one of the most hurtful things that you can do. And, and I hate this sin, and we all ought to have a proper hatred of this sin specifically. If nothing else, this is, this is a very big deal. And... We're going to look at a lot of scripture tonight, a lot of wisdom, especially from the book of Proverbs. That's why we started off there. But um, when you commit adultery, you're automatically making yourself a liar. You're breaking part of those vows that you made unto your wife when you go into the arms of another person and have that type of a relationship with them instead of staying only unto, unto your wife or your husband. You're also in, inherently involved in that is covetousness. Because you're desiring something that you can't have. Something, you know, desiring your neighbor's wife or your neighbor's husband. Something that doesn't belong to you. Those are, you're, you're inherently breaking three of the Ten Commandments right away. Coveting, lying, and adultery. All are wrapped up into that one sin. Very, very grievous sin. The, and it's so bad. I mean, adultery is such a bad sin. And, and, and we live in this culture where people just have come to accept it where it's just not a big deal. It's like husband and wife nowadays are just boyfriend and girlfriend and that it's just, well, we're just going to be boyfriend and girlfriend for a little bit longer. Or we're just going to get married because we have children. Or we're going to get married because we live together and we're going to get a tax break. And the marriage itself has, has been drugged through the dirt and doesn't mean anything. I mean, when you have people saying, hey, let's just let homos get married, marriage apparently doesn't mean anything. It, 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 is, it has come to be a meaningless thing. Whenever we're just going to have, let's just let these, these animals, you know what, I'm going to have my a ceremony for my dogs. Because that's what it's like when you have two homos getting married. It's like, I might as well just have my labs have a marriage and we could say, hey, yeah, this is, 
Mr. and Mrs. So-and-so, this is, you know, and they're our dogs, and they're married. Marriage is defined in the Bible, and you know, I, I don't get on a big kick of, of the, the marriage thing because the government is all screwed up and out of whack anyways, and if we were going to do things the biblical way, marriage wouldn't even come up as, as an issue at all because we would be having God's proper commandment on how to deal with sodomites, which is putting them to death. Just is this, which is the same exact punishment, by the way, for adultery. In Leviticus chapter 20, verse number 10, because people always go, oh yeah, oh, you're, you're always talking about the Sodomites and how they ought to be put to death. What about all these other sins? Yeah, I agree with that too. I agree with these other commandments in the Bible as well. I agree with Leviticus 20, 10, that says, and the man that committeth adultery with another man's wife even he that committeth adultery with his neighbor's wife, the adulterer and the adulteress shall surely be put to death. That is the only solution for adultery. That's it. And we've come to, to hit a soft spot with, for the adulterers in our society today because there's so many of them. As I was preaching this morning, you know, the more common a sin becomes, the more accepted it becomes, the more people are... are don't even want to say anything against it because they don't want to be a hypocrite because they've done the same thing. When you get more and more people, it becomes more and more accepted to where nobody wants to even mention it as being wrong, let alone hating it and suggesting that it ought to be guilty of the death penalty. When that's exactly what the Bible says. Satan is, and I preached this last week, Satan is out trying to destroy our families. And there is not a better way to destroy a family than through the sin of adultery. That drives a wedge right at the heart of that family, right in between the husband and wife. When you lose that trust, when you, when you hurt somebody so bad by committing that sin, you know, God forbid that that thought would ever enter any of your minds. Even one time, the thought of going and being with another person other than your spouse. If that thought ever, met, ever enters your mind, you ought to get on your knees and pray to God and ask God to help you with the thoughts of your mind and with the wicked flesh of your lusts of your flesh and get that settled immediately. Because you say, oh, well, it's just a thought. It's not that big of a deal. No, it's just a thought today. Tomorrow it's going to be action. All the major sins that you do, they don't, they, it's not just one day you're walking to work and then all of a sudden you stumble like, oh, I just committed adultery. It doesn't work like that. It works, it, it works up to that point. It, it's, there's a lot of things that are going to happen before that. You start walking down that wrong path. You start walking to the way of the strange woman and start walking by her house back and forth. And then you start talking to her. And then before you know it, that's when you start going into her house. And then the adultery occurs. It, it's, a, it's a process that builds up to that point. We need to be able to stop anything that would make you ever come even close to this sin. And, and we're going to go over that a little bit later in the sermon too about what we can do to avoid ever getting, because this is such a, a bad thing. I'm sure everybody in this room would agree with me how horrible and how grievous of a sin adultery would be. And, you know, all the adults in this room today are married. So all you have to do is just think about how you would feel if your spouse committed adultery on you. And, and nobody, obviously that, that would be a terrible thing. So remember that too, because what, what happens most of the time with adultery is that it's, it's, it's just completely selfishness. All you ever think about is yourself. Anyone who commits adultery, they're not thinking about their spouse. They're thinking about themselves. They're thinking about me. They're thinking, oh, poor me. Oh, my wife doesn't do anything for me. Oh, my wife's always nagging on me. Oh, my, you know, my husband doesn't fix anything. My husband doesn't do this. My husband's always gone. I need to go and do this. And it's me, me, me. Poor me. I've had everything so wrong. Now I need to talk to, to this person or that person to, because they care about me. And then you start forming a relationship with somebody else, someone who's not your spouse. And the next thing you know it, you're, you're, you're making these, these, these bonds with each other, and then adultery is the next step. And we need to make sure that that doesn't happen. Now, I, did I have you turn to 2 Samuel chapter 12? And we're going we're gonna to go back to Proverbs 5. But in 2 Samuel 12, we're going to see, because you remember, obviously, the story of David. David committed adultery with Bathsheba. Bathsheba was the wife of Uriah the Hittite. Now think about how horrible of a sin this was. And I preached this sermon last year and I said before we started this series that I probably wasn't going to go through all of them if I had already preached an entire sermon dedicated to the subject. 
But adultery is so important and it's so rampant in our culture today that I thought, you know what, it's already been an entire year practically. I'm going to preach this sermon again. And we covered this last time, but with David, his sin was... I mean, here's a man after God's own heart. And this is all the more reason why this is important to us. A man after God's own heart, someone who is used mightily by God, someone whom God loved, commit one of the most atrocious sins that, like, that you can ever commit. Here's a man... Uriah the Hittite was one of his top soldiers. He was one of his top 30 men. I mean, this is a mighty man of El. This is a man that, that loved David, who, who was very respectful, did everything that he said. He was so obedient, so good unto David that when <laughs> David was trying to cover up his sin, when, when he had committed adultery with this man's wife, I mean, first of all, this is, he knows this man. This isn't some stranger's wife. This is one of his best men. He commits adultery with that man's wife. He knows it's his wife. And then he tries to cover up the fact because she had gotten pregnant. He tries to cover that up, calls him back from the war because he's out fighting the battle while David just sitting on his rear in his, in his house, in his, you know, in his palace, looking at these women from his roof instead of himself being out there fighting as well. He calls him back from the war and tries to, you know, he tries to get him drunk. He tries to send him home. He tries to get him to have this relationship with his wife so that he, can say, he could just assume, oh, it's his child and everything else, and he could cover up his sin. But it's not working because this man, Uriah, was, was I mean, he was such a noble person. He had such integrity. He says, you know what? It's not right for me to go and, and, and have a nice time and have the enjoyment of my wife when all of my brothers, all the, you know, everybody else is out there. They're fighting. They're battling. He says, you know what? I'm just going to stay right here. I'm not going to allow this, this pleasure and satisfaction for myself because in spirit and in heart, he was still with the battle. He was still with his duty and still with his job. And, and it was a noble act that he was trying to do. So David also, but um, David wasn't able to cover this up. So in David's eyes, he said, well, there's, you know, there's, there's not much else he can do if he wants to cover this up. He has to have Uriah killed, which is exactly what he does. He writes a letter to Joab, the captain of the host, the captain of the army, writes a letter, seals it. He trusts Uriah so much He's such a faithful servant to him, he gives him the letter. He says, here, Uriah, take this and deliver it to Joab. He knows he's not going to open up and read it, because if he did, he'd see, well, you're going to have me killed. Because that's exactly what he told Joab to do. Put him in the hottest part of the battle, and when the enemy comes, hey, retreat from him and let him die. That's what David's orders were to Joab. Put him in the battle fall back away from him so that he just dies by himself. Uriah delivers the letter to Joab, never looks at it, doesn't touch it, faithful servant, delivers his own death warrant unto Joab. David takes advantage of that man. I mean, that, that is so wicked. That is so wicked. There's no way you can look at that any other way. He's, he did this grievous sin in the adultery the betrayal and the, 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 the murder of her husband. And why this is so important for us, David was a saved man. David did a lot of great things. This is the, 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 the major, major, major down point in David's life when, when he commit this sin. Now, every man in the Bible commits sin. Some worse than others, but, but even the best men in the Bible have committed some pretty horrible sins. Moses killed a man with his bare hands. I mean, he, he killed him. Okay, now you might say that what he did was a little bit more justified, but he still commit murder. I mean, it wasn't what he was supposed to do. He was supposed to lead the children, but he thought this was the best way for him to do it. But every man in the Bible, even the great men, have still fallen, have still come short, and they still have committed sins, even pretty major sins. So when you look at someone and say, oh, well, I've never done this or I've never done that, don't think that it never can happen to you. We need these warnings 
as much as anybody. And if you think that, oh, well, that will never happen to me, all the more reason for you to listen intently and to make sure that this doesn't happen. I mean, God forbid that, that anything like this would happen to anyone in this room. But it's happened to greater men than me. Definitely, it's happened to greater men than, than probably everybody here. David was able to succumb to the lust of his flesh and, and committed an act that he should never have committed. And um, we're going to see tonight, we're going to look at the Bible, try to, to gain the wisdom and instruction so that nothing like this would ever happen in our lives. But look at um, chapter 12. After David did all this, so, so all these sins have been committed, all these, these trespasses, he already did them all. Okay, and he's thinking he got away with it. Uriah is dead. He marries Bathsheba. They have a child. And case closed, right? Well, yeah, you may have been able to fool some of the people or most of the people, the majority of the kingdom, but he didn't fool God. God always knows the things that we do, and God's going to bring that, God does bring that back upon his head. And look at how David responds, because Nathan the prophet then goes to David after all this stuff happens, and he confronts David on his sin. And, but see, we also see here what, what, what David ends up doing, and it's not part of my notes. David humbles himself. This is why God loved David so much, is that even when he does the worst thing, now he got punished, don't get me wrong. God didn't like, even necessarily take it easy on him. He, he had a lot of punishments come his way as a result of his sin, but because he loves him. But David also had a humble attitude and was able to recognize when he had done wrong and repent and get on his knees and just beg God for mercy and for forgiveness after he had done these things and change his ways. And that's what we need to be doing on a regular basis with all of our sins. This is the type of humble attitude that we need to maintain in order to stay in good standing with God. But let's see how Nathan approaches David. Look at uh, verse number 1 of 2 Samuel chapter 12. The Bible says, And the Lord sent Nathan unto David. The God sending Nathan. This is a message directly from God. And he came unto him and said unto him, There were two men in one city, the one rich and the other poor. The rich man had exceeding many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing save one little ewe lamb, which he had bought and nourished up, and it grew up together with him and with his children. It did eat of his own meat and drank of his own cup and lay in his bosom and was unto him as a daughter. And there came a traveler unto the rich man, and he spared to take of his own flock and of his own herd to dress for the wayfaring man that was come unto him, but took the poor man's lamb and dressed it for the man that was come to him. And David's anger was greatly kindled against the man. And he said to Nathan, As the Lord liveth, the man that hath done this thing shall surely die. And he shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing and because he had no pity. And Nathan said to David, Thou art the man. Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I anointed thee king over Israel, and I delivered thee out of the hand of Saul. So Nathan says to David, hey, look, that's you. David was real quick to judgment on this, right? He didn't ask any of the details. He didn't need to hear them. He says, I can't believe that. A rich man, he had flocks, herds. He had everything at his disposal. He could have easily have fed this man with this food. And he said, but no, instead he takes the poor man, all that he had, everything, you know, something that he dearly loved, and he took that and killed that. He says, that man deserves to die. And Nathan says, that's you. Because as king, David had anything he wanted. He already had multiple wives. He, I mean, he could have taken another wife if he wanted. Not, not that that's acceptable or condoned, but he had all, I mean, he could, he could have done what he wanted to do outside of committing adultery with another man's wife. But that's what he did. I mean, Uriah the Hittite, he was, he was a pro, I mean, we don't know if he's a poor man or not. It doesn't matter. I mean, the, the parable gets the meaning across. But this man's wife, I mean, the, the, the woman that he dearly loves and holds and cherishes close to him, why did David have to take that from him? And, you know, that's what you're doing. You betray that trust and you... Um, it's hurtful. You're hurting another person. Go back, if you would, to Proverbs chapter 5, where we started reading. Proverbs.
Proverbs 5 and Proverbs 6 both have a lot of wisdom in this area. Of Now, of course, the Bible is written and it's always going to be referring to the strange woman and with the, the, the point of view of the man and the woman. Okay, but obviously, ladies, you know, apply this to yourselves as appropriate. Um, we're just going to read through this, and I'm not always going to try to be gender neutral or anything. I'm going to read the Bible the way it's written, but you can take it for what it says. It's still applicable to men and women um, the same as far as adultery goes. Now, look at verse number one. The Bible says, My son, attend unto my wisdom and bow thine ear to my understanding. I love that we see multiple times in the book of Proverbs, bow thine ear to my understanding. We need to be humble to receive God's wisdom. To receive this instruction, we have to recognize, hey, I need to learn from God. I'm going to humble myself and listen to what he has to say. Listen to this instruction and this understanding and have a humble heart. Verse number two, that thou mayest regard discretion and that thy lips may keep knowledge. Now, first of all, my first point I want to make as far as like avoidance of, of adultery is keeping things discreet in your dealings with other people. Now, if you're a lady, the way that you're dressed, being dressed discreetly, and I, you know, again, there's the, the political correctness of this culture. They, they will say, because what I say is, look, don't dress like what you have is for sale if it's not. Don't dress in the attire of a harlot if you're not a harlot. When you dress a certain way, you're going to provoke a man's lust to, to, to want something from you. And oftentimes when women get raped or when they have things happen like that, when, when men come on to them, there is a direct correlation with the way that they're dressed and those things that happen. Now, that's a fact. You can say, oh, well, they shouldn't be doing that. It doesn't matter. It's a fact. That's what happens. And women need to recognize, say, oh, well, women shouldn't have to change that. Yes, they should because you, you can't just dress provocatively and, and incite lust in other men because that's the way that men are designed. That's the way God made men. Now, it may be wrong for a man to lust after a woman, but the, the, more, the less clothing that you're wearing, the more likely a man is to be lusting after you. Because that's just the way we're designed. And that's why God is, has told us that women are supposed to dress in modest apparel and have discretion and be discreet. Now, it's not just with clothing. We need dis discretion in the way that we speak, too. These innuendos and these jokes when you're in mixed company or when you're around other people is, is wrong and wicked. You shouldn't be speaking about things that go on in the bedroom. You shouldn't be making the, having that type of conversation or those types of jokes because that's another way that will lead into this direction of adultery. People start breaking down these barriers and breaking down these walls and trying to get you, sometimes it's even uncomfortable, but then they think once they get you uncomfortable first, then you'll start to say, oh, well, it's not that big of a deal and lower your guard a little bit. And again, adultery, it never goes immediately right into adultery. You know, it always starts earlier on with something. And, and usually the people that commit adultery, it's with someone they know. It's with a friend. It could be with somebody from church. Happens all the time. And we're going to see that from this chapter. We need to keep our guard up. We need to be wise. We need to make sure that the things that we talk about, the way that we dress, the way that we act around people is appropriate. That we're not you know, getting all huggy and lovey-dovey with people that aren't your spouse, that we're not speaking in a manner and using terms of endearments or whatever things that, that, are, that are too friendly to, to communicate with someone that's not your spouse and start getting real buddy-buddy with people, especially of the opposite gender. Um, it's wrong. It's wicked. We need to stay away from that. And, and be discreet with, with the way that we um, deal with our friends. Now, it doesn't mean you can't have really good friends and, and spend time together and do fun things. Let's keep it appropriate, though. Men, don't be, don't be getting real buddy-buddy with your friend's wife. Don't do it. And ladies, don't get real buddy-buddy with, with another woman's husband. You don't ever need to have a relationship like that. It, it, I mean, 
and this is the way it should be. You know, the men should be friends with each other and the ladies can be friends with each other and, and you do your things and that's the way it is and that's appropriate. You don't need to be getting close with, with another man's husband or wife. It's just going to lead you down that wrong path. Let's keep reading here. So discretion, we need to maintain that discretion. Verse number three, for the lips of a strange woman drop as in honeycomb and her mouth is smoother than oil. So one of the ways that an adulterer or adulteress is going to try to deceive you is, hey, the things that they say, they, they're real smooth. Her lips are sweet. You know, and this is always the way it is. You, especially if someone's having a rough time in their marriage, they're going to look at someone else and just all they're going to see are the good things. They're going to see these positive qualities in somebody else. It's, oh, this is all lacking from my relationship and this person, has, that's exactly what I want. And the only reason they think that is because they're not married to them. They don't really know them. You know, any person who's just all, you know, their lips are, are like honey and their mouth is smooth and all the things, oh, you're so great, you're so handsome. You know, the, the, the adulteress that's trying to, trying to get a, a, ma a married man to, to um, commit adultery with her would just be praising him and telling him how great he is and all this other, oh man, my wife doesn't do any of this. But then he goes and commits that act and then he starts to get to know that person a lot more and it's like, she's not all she's cracked up to be, especially if she's out as an adulteress hunting for men. That is an extremely wicked woman that you don't want to have anything to do with. And she's going to try to appeal to your, to, to, to you using flatteries and try to, try to lift you up but um, it's a trap and it's a trick. That's, that's what it says here in verse number four. But her end is bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two-edged sword. It's like poison, right? It'd be, it's, it's like um, the, the poison that you put out, like rat poison or whatever. Right? It tastes real good to the, to the animals that get into it and they love it and they eat it all up and then they die. That's, that's what a, an adulteress is like. She makes herself real appealing on the outside and will say good things but her ways are the ways of death. Now look at verse number five. Her feet go down to death. Her steps take hold on hell, lest thou shouldest ponder the path of life. Her ways are movable, that thou canst not know them. Hear me now, therefore, O ye children, and depart not from the words of my mouth. Remove thy way far from her, and come not nigh the door of her house. Avoid her at all costs. Don't have anything to do with it. Look, you have patterns and, and things that you do in your life. You'll, you go to this grocery store or whatever. When there's an adulteress, man, if you, I mean, if you ever go out and you go shopping at a particular grocery store or whatever, and your schedule just always happens to be at the same time as this cashier who's always hitting on you and always saying these nice things. Look, change your schedule. Keep your way far from her. Okay, ladies, same thing, right? I mean, whatever your situation may be, if, you're, if, if you get into a routine and you're doing something and um, just by nature of your routine, hey, this is the time I always have available go, to go to the hardware store to go and do this or go and do that and I'm going there relatively frequently and there's always the same person there and they're always starting to make some advances or inappropriate, like, avoid that. Avoid that at all costs. And in, in this situation, it's like, look, you know there's a, there's a, there's a whore or a, a adulteress or something like that, lives in a certain house. You want to go take a walk? Don't go walk past her house. Don't even give yourself the slightest opportunity to even come into contact with a person like that, if at all possible. And you know that someone's there. He's saying, look, remove thy way, the way that you go far from her, and come not nigh. Don't even come close to the door of her house. Lest thou give thine honor unto others in thy years unto the cruel. Verse number 10, Let strain, lest strangers be filled with thy wealth and thy labors be in the house of a stranger. You are going to receive a recompense from your error by of you know other people getting filled with your wealth you're going to be spending your money on these adulteresses and other people are going to be profiting off of that and not yourself verse number 11 and thou mourn at the last when thy flesh and thy body are consumed committing adultery is going to bring disease too by the way these women who are out to to hunt for the the precious life you're probably not the only one that they've done this to. If they're looking to find someone who's already taken, someone who's already spoken for, 
and they're going after you, what really makes you think that you're so special? They'll try to make you think that you're that special, but you're not, not in their eyes. A lot of times with women like this or men like that, it's, it's a conquest. They have some game, some thing in their mind. It's a lot harder to get someone who's already taken, already married, than just to get some other random guy off the street that's not taken by anybody. And to them, it's a game and it's a challenge to go out and try to get this person. So they'll lay it on real thick and they'll try to trap you. And it's like, they don't care. Some, some people's hearts, and you have to understand, some people's hearts are that wicked. That that's the way they look at it and that's the way they think about it. And that that's all they care. It's a game. People have no morals, no values, no respect for anyone else, no respect for your wife, no respect for your husband, whoever the other person is. There's people out there that are like that and we need to be aware of this and watch out for it. And how could you think, it, <laughs> it boggles my mind. I, I've had men and women both talk about this person that, that they started having a relationship with who was already married and it's like, you're thinking about marrying this person who's married to someone else? Like they're cheating on their spouse right now. What makes you think they're going to be faithful to you? They already made a vow to this person. They're breaking that vow. They're betraying their trust. And with you, and you think, oh, well, I'm so special because they're doing it with me because we were meant to be. How do you know in five years that they're not going to do the exact same thing to you because they're already done it once? Don't be deceived by these adulterers. And that's why, again, I mean, you see people that have these multiple marriages that get divorced and remarried and divorced and remarried. And it happens multiple times because it's the same cycle. They get bored with someone or they get, you know, they start actually having problems in their marriage. And they expected there to be no problems and everything was to be roses and rainbows every single day of their life, every minute of the day. And that we're going to have zero conflict. And then the conflict comes and they're like, oh, maybe this isn't the right person. No, maybe you just need to work at it because it's a marriage. Because you've made that commitment, that vow. If there would be no reason to make the commitment if, it was, if there were going to be no part times and no problems. Because, of course, you'd stay together because there's no reason not to. The reason you make that commitment, that vow, is because of the fact that you know that it's not going to be that easy. You know that there's going to be trials and struggles and things that are going on. And you have to keep yourself in, you know, constantly aware of this and make sure that you are doing your best to keep your marriage together. Now, um, where was I? Let's keep reading here. Verse number 12. And say, how have I hated instruction in my heart, despised reproof, and have not obeyed the voice of my teachers, nor inclined mine ear to them that instructed me. I was almost in all evil. Look at this, verse 14. I was almost in all evil in the midst of the congregation and assembly. In the midst of church. Remember I said that earlier, that this even happens within church? And if you think about it, it makes sense. You, you know, if, if you're trying to do what's right, you're living godly, maybe you're making changes in your life, you don't want to be around certain people, you're, you're trying to make a lot of changes, you say, well, these are good godly people, I want to make friends with them. And great. Do it. There's nothing wrong with that. Let's have unity in the church. We should be friends with each other. We should be able to even go out outside of church and hang out and do, you know, and, and, and have fun times together and stuff like that. But keep the discretion there because you need to make sure you're keep you're, you're always, even with, even with other good godly people, look, nobody is above temptation. Nobody is above the, you know, the lusts of the flesh. No one's above that. David wasn't above that, okay? Now, you may be doing just fine in this area, but you don't know if someone else is. So, now if you, could, if you can keep yourselves having a, a, a normal, decent, discreet type of relationship, then great, you, you won't have to worry about that. You know, that's not going to be a problem for you, but as soon as those barriers start breaking down, as soon as, you know, the men and women start spending time together doing things or, you know, and, and this happens. I can't tell you how many times this happened where one man's wife has a certain interest and another woman's husband has the same interest and they think, oh, well, my spouse doesn't like doing this, your spouse doesn't like doing that, let's go and do this together. For, I mean, it could be anything. Think of like going out and shooting guns, right? You could have one man that's married to a woman where he really likes to go out and shoot guns. It's not her thing. She doesn't like doing that at all, his wife, right? But they have a friend. Some of their best friends they're married too. 
And the, that man, yeah, he's not really into shooting guns, but hey, his wife, she's all for it. And what happens is these people, they, they become really good friends. You know, they're, they have each other over for dinner. They go spend time together, everything else. And they say, hey, why don't we go shooting together? You know, they can go and do whatever else. Or, you know, let's just go. We both like doing this. We have this common interest. Let's go shoot guns. And, of course, you think, well, I trust my husband. I trust my wife. You know, no, everything's just fine. You know, I love my spouse, everything else. And then they start to form a little bit of a habit. And now these two are going off and doing something and spending time together alone and getting to know each other in a different way, in a different setting than is appropriate. Okay, it's not appropriate to be doing things like that. I don't care how much you think, oh, I would never check. Look, that is not appropriate. Don't ever put yourself in a situation like that. Now, I just made up one. Fill in the blank. It doesn't matter what the activity is. Whatever your specific activity is, it, it could be anything in the world. Don't allow things like that to happen. This can happen in the midst of the congregation. Don't have this false sense of trust that, well, this is people from church. That would never happen. For one, there are people that we are warned of as creeping into churches unawares, people whose eyes are full of adultery and cannot cease from sin. There are going to be people like that in the church. You don't want to let your spouse go off with a person like that because on the outside they seem to be Mr. or Mrs. Christian and they seem to be some great person, but on, in, on the inside they're ravening wolves that are coming in to seek and destroy. That is another thing that you need to look out for and we need to be vigilant of. And if you can, you can just maintain a, a discreet set of rules for yourself, you won't have to worry about something like that happening to you. But you'd have to be diligent about keeping, just, just maintaining these own rules for yourself in your life with your spouse and just say, we're never, we're never gonna do this. I mean, one way that I can know for sure that my children are ever going to be abused is if I don't let them out of my sight, right? If I don't just send them off with random people or even people I know, even certain you know, family members or whatever, people might give you a hard time about it. But if I have this rule in place, I can know for sure nothing's going to happen to them. Amen. That's the only way. Now, you do something similar with your wife and with your husband. And, and you know, you, you know especially, well, the husband, I mean, the husband's going to be one making the rules. And the husband's, look, especially, you make these rules for your family. You don't want your wife ending up committing adultery on you just as much as you don't want to commit adultery on them. And you make up these, you, these rules that are going to work and apply them to yourself the same way that you're going to apply them to your wife as far as not having friends of the opposite gender where you go out on a lunch date or you go out and do other things together and spend time alone. I won't even let myself be in, like, give a, a ride to, to someone of the opposite gender unless there's like a third person or someone else around to, to maintain accountability and to maintain some level of, of you know, uprightness. And I don't even care how unlikely the scenario might be. I'm going to stick to that. I don't want to tempt anything close to adultery. Not even close and, and ever let that in to my life. And you know, people might look at you and say, oh, you're so strict or you're so rigid. Why don't you loosen up a little bit? No, when it comes to my marriage, no. I'm not going to loosen up a little bit, okay? That's my wife and I'm her husband and we are going to make sure that our marriage lasts for as long as we both shall live. I'm going to dead sure make sure that that happens if I have anything to do about it, which I do <laughs> because it's my marriage. But um, I made a vow unto my wife and I'm not a liar. And she's not a liar either and we're going to make this work. And, um, you know, we all, everybody ought to have that same attitude and set up um, rules for yourself. Now let's keep reading here. Verse number 15. The Bible says, Drink waters out of thine own cistern. That belongs to you, not someone else's. Don't go looking for um, affection from other people. Drink waters out of thine own cistern and running waters out of thine own well. Let thy fountains be dispersed abroad and rivers of waters in the streets. Let them be only thine own and not strangers with thee. Let thy fountain be blessed and rejoice with the wife of thy youth. Let her be as the loving hind in pleasant row. Let her breast satisfy thee at all times and be thou ravished always with her love. Look,
make sure that you love your spouse and you're spending proper time with them. Okay? The Bible teaches you need to be ravished always with her love. So you're not looking for someone else. You might say, well, it's really difficult. You know, my wife is so mean to me. My wife doesn't seem to care about me or anything else. You need to, and individually, we're all individuals here. Now you're married, but you individually have to decide for yourself that I want this marriage to last and I am going to do whatever it takes to make sure this lasts. So even if your husband or your wife isn't holding up their end, they're, they're being a jerk or they're being mean or they're not listening to you or they're not, you know, they're not falling into their role appropriately. You need to make sure that you are doing your job and doing as much as possible and that, that even if the other person isn't quite, you know, matching up to where you think they should be, you say, you know what, this is important. I am going to work hard at this. I am going to do what I can do. I am going to be ravished with my wife's love. I am just going to set my affection on her and not allow for, for my mind to be wandering about other people. I'm going to be satisfied with her and her alone. And that's it. And I'm going to make sure I spend time with her. And if for some reason I find myself not so much being ravished with my wife's love, I need to spend more time with her. I need to change that about myself. And this is something you can now, God forbid that would happen. I don't have this problem at all. But, but you have to make sure, it says, look, it says, always, be thou ravished always with her love. This is someone that, that you need to have your attention focused on um, and don't let your mind stray away from her. Verse number 20, And why wilt thou, my son, be ravished with a strange woman and embrace the bosom of a stranger? For the ways of man are before the eyes of the Lord, and he pondereth all his goings. His own iniquity shall take the wicked himself, and he shall be holden with the cords of his sins. He shall die without instruction, and in the greatness of his folly he shall go astray. Turn, if you would, to um, Proverbs 6. We're in Proverbs 5. Proverbs 6, we're going to start reading verse number 20. I'm going to try to go through these a little bit faster um, because of how much time I've been spending here. But there's, just, there's so much depth and there's so much content in these Proverbs. There's so much wisdom to be gained. And our marriages are extremely important in our life. We need to make sure that they last. You need to make sure that you're not going to make yourself out to be a liar and that you are investing properly in your marriage and that you are being wise with the way that you deal with things in your life. Verse number 20 of, of Proverbs 6. My son, keep thy father's commandment and forsake not the law of thy mother. Bind them continually upon thine heart. This, and, and this is the whole reason why we're doing this again, even though I just preached this last year. This needs to be something continually bound upon your heart. We need to keep this fresh in our minds because you're going to you're, you're here tonight you're on board say yes we don't have any problem with this this is great but then it's going to memory's going to fade over time and if you're not being diligent about it you're going to start making exceptions you're going to start just your mind's going to start wandering or whatever you need to, to be diligent about keeping this continually upon your heart that's why we need to read our bibles every day we need to be reading our bibles the point you're going through it i mean bare bones minimum you're getting through the bible once a year so that you can keep this refreshed in your mind. So when you go back through the Proverbs, it's like, yeah, you know, maybe I'm not doing this right. Maybe I'm, I'm letting myself, maybe I'm, I'm looking at other men or looking at other women or my heart's not right with my spouse. And, you know, we can get this refreshed even if it's not coming across the pulpit as much as maybe even it should. I don't know. But um, if you're doing your own reading, it's, it's, it's God's law, it's God's commandments that should be continually upon your heart. Let's keep reading. Tie them about thy neck. Verse number 22. When thou goest, it shall lead thee. When thou sleepest, it shall keep thee. And when thou awakest, it shall talk with thee. For the commandment is a lamp, and the law is light, and reproofs of instruction are the way of life to keep thee from the evil woman. This is, this is what's so interesting. He's, he's talking about the commandment. He's talking about the law. He's saying, look, this is a light. This is going to light up your pathway and show you which way to go, show you which decisions to make. This is the light that you have. And what is it going to do for you? It's going to keep you from the evil woman, from the flattery of the tongue of the strange woman. The, the strange woman that, that's going to want to commit adultery, she's going to use flattering words. She's going to butter you up. She's going to try to, to gain your affection by saying a lot of nice things to you. And men generally have a tendency to eat it up. Be aware of this, men. Don't let that get into your heart. 
Don't let some strange woman's compliments and flattery telling you how great you are try to steal your heart away from your spouse. Don't accept it. Don't accept be, be aware. When you start to hear the flattery, that should be red flags going off in your head right away going, okay. And, and see, a lot of times men will be like, there's no way that this girl's going to come on to me, right? You hear that type of stuff, you're like, she's not, she's not interested in me. Women say the same thing, okay? Now, maybe they are, maybe they're not. But when you start to hear that, red flags are going to go off and be like, whoa, I better make sure that I just keep my way far from this person because I'd rather lose a friend than lose my wife. I mean, if it came down to that, if it, was, if it was making a choice between possibly offending someone that I don't know if they're interested in me or not, but they sure are using a lot of flattering words and sure are saying a lot of things that I'm starting to say, this is inappropriate. You know, this person shouldn't be lifting me up this way. Maybe they're just being nice, but maybe they're not. And the Bible warns us about the flattery of the tongue. And you know what? They're probably not. It's probably not just being nice. They probably are just using these flattery words because they've got some other motive. That's probably the case. Now, again, I don't want to take that chance. And this is what we're talking about tonight. You could say, well, no, they're not. You know, don't take the chance. Keep yourself far enough distanced from that so that it's not going to be an issue. Verse number 25, lust not after her beauty in that heart. So you see a person, I mean, obviously there's a lot of people in this world. Some men and some women are more handsome or beautiful than others. And you might see, you know, have some kind of attraction. Look, don't lust after people's beauty, especially the outward beauty. Don't lust after that. You should be happy and take gladness with, with, the, the wife, with your own wife and don't look on someone else's outward appearance. Neither let her take thee with her eyelids. For by means of a whorish woman, a man is brought to a piece of bread. And the adulteress, and this is what I was talking about before, people who do this, the adulteress will hunt for the precious life. That's what the Bible says. There are people out there, there's adulteresses out there that are hunting for the precious life. It's a game to them. It's a sport. Just like I got drawn for elk, I'm going to go and try to track down and hunt down and kill an elk and destroy that elk and eat it up. Adulteresses are the same way. They're hunting for the precious life. They're going to track them down and do what they can and set traps using the flattering words, using the immodest dress, using the flirtations or whatever else it may be to appeal to the lust of your flesh, to appeal to, to the to your pride, to your ego, to these things that are going to, whatever they think is going to attract themselves to you. And if you're a godly man, they're going to try to make themselves look like a godly woman. Watch out for it. They're going to think, this is what this, this man is interested in. They're interested in a godly woman. I'm going to try to make myself look super spiritual and give them all the flatteries in the world so that they're going to look at, at you and say, Oh, wow, this woman is amazingly spiritual. She is much better than my wife. She is obeying God's word so much more than my wife is to try to gain that attraction. Watch out for that. Ladies, same thing. Man, this, this man, he's a real man of God. He is, I mean, he is doing these right things. I, want, I, I would just love to be his, be his wife. That's wickedness, but that's going to be one of the ways that the adulterer or adulteress is going to hunt for that life. They're going to find out what, what you deem to be worthy or attractive or whatever, and they're going to use that against you. And just be aware of that. And it, the, the flattery will always be there, though. They're always going to use that flattery. That should set off the red flags. Watch out for that. Now, don't go overboard. If someone just gives you a compliment, okay, be able to receive a compliment. You know, there's a difference between just being friendly with someone and giving a compliment. Hey, you look really nice tonight. That's a nice skirt. That's a nice dress. Okay. Now, if someone's just real habit habitually, you know, doing that and going overboard, okay, that's flattery. Just being nice. Hey, it's good to see you. Thanks for, you know, whatever. There's, you should be able to tell the difference. You use your discretion with that as well. But, um, you know, I don't want to just scare you into thinking that, that like every single word that comes out of a person's mouth is going to be flattery because it's not. But, but keep it in mind. Okay. Verse number 27. 
The Bible says, can a man take fire in his bosom and his clothes not be burned? Can one go upon hot coals and his feet not be burned? Look, if you mess with fire, you're going to be burned. He's saying, don't, you know, this is the warning of like, it's not going to work out good for you, men, if you decide to, to go after the strange woman. If you, if you actually go through with this act, it's, you're going to get burned. So even in yet, you, you know, people get blinded by this deception of another person other than their spouse, this adultery. And what's going to happen? You may have that, that, that physical interaction or enjoyment, which I couldn't even see how you could enjoy that because I would think you're always going to be thinking, I can't believe I'm committing adultery. You know, like, like you wouldn't even probably enjoy it to begin with. But even if you did, I mean, there's ramifications that are going to happen right after that. And the Bible says, I mean, you are going to reap what you sow. And another reason not to do this is you should dread what God is going to rain down on you if you commit such a horrible act. I mean, if nothing else, even if you are, in, are not having, if you are having the worst time you've ever had with your spouse, you better fear God enough to not go out and, and, and hurt them in that way and commit that act. Because God will make sure that you get what's coming to you. He says, you can't go upon hot coals and your feet not get burned. You can't take fire in your bosom and your clothes aren't going to get all burned up. Okay, you're going to be brought to nothing. That's why it says, her steps lead down to hell. Okay. It says, verse 29, So he that goeth in to his neighbor's wife, whosoever toucheth her shall not be innocent. And, and here's the other part of it. Here's the other aspect. Look at verse number 30. Men do not despise a thief if he steal to satisfy his soul when he is hungry. But if he be found, he shall restore sevenfold. He shall give all the substance of his house. He's saying, look, people don't, you know, obviously stealing is wrong. It's wicked. It's a sin. You should never do it. But there's a little bit of understanding. If you're, if you're hungry and you're poor and you don't have anything and you go out and steal, people aren't going to want to kill you because you stole to feed yourself. Now, it's wrong. You should be working out. You know, there's, there's other ways you go about getting yourself fed other than stealing, right? But... People aren't going to have it out for you so much to kill you because you're like, well, the, you know, the guy's hungry. Okay, yeah, you need to restore sevenfold. You're going to still be punished. You still need to, you know, to, to make this right. But when you commit adultery with another man's wife, there's no making that right in his eyes. If another man commit adultery with my wife, you can't make it right with me. You can't do it. It's not going to happen. Look what the Bible says. Verse number 32, But whoso committeth adultery with a woman lacketh understanding. He that doeth it destroyeth his own soul. A wound and dishonor shall he get, and his reproach shall not be wiped away. For jealousy is the rage of a man. Therefore, he will not spare in the day of vengeance. He will not regard any ransom. Neither will he rest content, though thou givest many gifts. If some man commit adultery with my wife and tried to pay me off, I'd be like, no way. I'd want, blood, I'd want that person dead. That's all I would, I would not be able to accept that this man is breathing after he violated my wife by laying with her, even if she did it consensually. I mean, the Bible says they both should be put to death if that were the case. If this was something consensual and they go off and do this thing, they deserve to die. If I were to do that, I mean, there's, there's no way that my wife would be like, oh yeah, give me, you know, $10,000, a million dollars, and then it'll be okay. No, you can't repair that. Turn, if you would, to Matthew chapter 5. I'm going to try to wrap this up quick. There's so, there's so much to preach on this subject. There's a lot I'm not going to get to tonight. People say, oh, well, that's all Old Testament. You know, you're preaching the Ten Commandments. That's all Old Testament. The law has been done away with. No, it hasn't. There are aspects of the law that have been fulfilled with Jesus Christ. But let's look at Jesus Christ's word in the New Testament. That's why we're going to Matthew chapter 5. We're going to see how he feels about this, about committing adultery. 
Okay, we're going to see if this is a little bit more strict or a little bit more lenient than, than what we read so far in the Old Testament. Matthew chapter 5, look at verse number 27. The Bible reads, Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you, so he's changing it, right? He's changing it. You've heard it said before, Thou shalt not commit adultery. But now... Go ahead and commit adultery. God's just fine with it. Is that what Jesus said? No, wait, let's just read it. The, the, that's not what it says. Verse 28, But I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. He's saying, don't even look at another woman and, and have those, those thoughts. He says, you look on another woman with lust after her heart, you've committed adultery in your heart. Your heart is already strayed away from your wife and you're committing adultery in your heart. Don't even look on a woman to lust after her. Now, is looking the same exact thing as committing the act? No, but Jesus is being very stern about this and saying don't even look at him because when you do, you're committing adultery in your heart. Now, you didn't commit the physical act of adultery, but in your heart you're committing that adultery. And that's when you do that act in your heart, that's what's going to lead to the next step of being the actual thing, of being the real deal. Okay, when your heart is departing from your, from your spouse, it's not going to be long before your body follows with your heart. And look what he said. He follows this up, right? He just says, whosoever looketh on a woman, he's talking about your eyes, looketh on a woman to lust after her, hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. Verse 29, and if thy right eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee, for it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. He's saying, look, there's a problem here. I mean, it's like, pluck your eye out. Now, obviously, there's a lot more meaning. I'm not going to get into all the meaning about this. You know, if you're saved, you can't lose your salvation. But um, this is how serious it is. He's using an extreme example here of plucking out your own eyeball. Okay? We need to make sure we're keeping our eyes and keeping our hearts, keeping our minds. I mean, doing whatever it takes, essentially, to make sure that we're not straying or committing adultery in our hearts, that, that we're doing everything possible that we can do. Let's keep reading here because we're going to see one other aspect of adultery. Besides committing adultery in your heart, verse 30, And if thy right hand offend thee, cut it off, and cast it from thee, for it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. It hath been said, Whosoever shall put away his wife, let him give her a writing of divorcement. But I say unto you, that whosoever shall put away his wife, saving for the cause of fornication, causeth her to commit adultery. And whosoever shall marry her that is divorced, committeth adultery. Adultery is a wicked sin, and Jesus Christ himself. New Testament, Jesus Christ is saying, look, if you get divorced, unless it was for the cause of fornication, and this is why the definitions of words are important, fornication is something that happens prior to marriage adultery is what happens after marriage so if you think you're getting you're going to because your wife or your spouse cheated on you you can get a divorce that's adultery the fornication happened and, and I've preached sermons about this in the past but look it up for yourself when Joseph was a just man thinking to put Mary away privily it was because she was found with child, but they had not consummated their marriage. They had not come together yet, even though they were espoused, they were husband and wife. It was something that they hadn't consummated the marriage. She was found already with child. So this is something that would have happened previously where she's not clean. She's not a virgin. She's not what, what the deal, what, what, what she said she was going to be when, you know, when we're getting married. That was the instance where divorce was allowed. But after you consummate that marriage, no longer allowed. Okay, and Jesus Christ is saying, if you put away your wife for any other reason, for any other reason other than this one reason that, that there was fornication, he says, you're causing her to commit adultery. You are causing them. Husband, you that puts away your wife for any other reason than the one that he specified, you're causing your wife to commit adultery. You are responsible for that by putting away your wife. And he says, and whosoever shall marry her that is divorced committeth adultery. So you're single. And you say, well, I've never been divorced. Don't look on another person who's already been divorced. 
unless her unless her ex-husband is dead and that law is finally done away but he says that's adultery that is ad that's Jesus Christ's words he says that's adultery this is not something that's relaxed in the New Testament whatsoever it is just as serious of a sin now as it was back when when God gave Moses the Ten Commandments now I have this in my notes but we're not going to go there Matthew 19 essentially says um, the same exact thing as Matthew 5 about putting away your wife except for fornication that's found twice in the book of Matthew it's also found in the other Gospels but it's found twice where Jesus Christ says that um, he also says that what therefore God hath joined together let not man put asunder right and that's talking about um, in that context he's talking about divorce but when you think about you two becoming one flesh and then you're making yourself become one with somebody else in a way you're dividing what God has brought together through your marriage you're dividing that asunder when you go and and, and make yourself one with somebody else it's it's you're you're perverting it you're you're corrupting it and you may you may not have completely divided it but you sure did wedge a big crack in that in that relationship and um So, well, I'll close with this. Um, there's so much stuff. All right. uh, you, you can sit. You, you, you're doing all right. I don't see anybody falling asleep just yet. I want to cover at least two more points here. Do it. Ephesians chapter 5 is very representative. Now, we don't have, you don't have to turn if you don't want to. Um, you know what? No, go ahead and turn there. Turn to Ephesians chapter 5. It's good for us to see this. Ephesians 5 explains a lot about husbands' roles and wives' roles in a marriage, right? We've heard this preached time and time again because our society has completely perverted the role of the husband and the wife. But what Ephesians 5 also does is it relates that to Jesus Christ and the church. Now, the way that you carry your marriage, the things that you do, is, is symbolic or representative of other spiritual matters, and it's representative of Jesus Christ in the church. And we need to keep this in our minds because when you look at Ephesians chapter 5, when it starts talking about the way a husband is supposed to, re to react and the way that a wife is supposed to be, he's relating that to Jesus Christ in the church. You are showing through your marriage a picture or an image of Jesus Christ and his relationship to the church. You want to make sure that you are not defiling that image when you commit adultery or when you get a divorce. You think about this, would Jesus Christ divorce the church? Because that's the relationship that he paints here with a husband and a wife. When the husband divorces his wife, that's like you saying that Jesus Christ would divorce the church and have nothing to do with the church. And say, I'm just going to completely, you know, stop taking care of you and I don't love you anymore and we have nothing to do with each other because we're getting a divorce. When you get a divorce from your, from your spouse in this lifetime, that's the representation that you're putting forth. But let's read this real quick. Ephesians chapter 5, verse, right near the end of the chapter, verse number 22. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. So we automatically, right off the bat, we're starting to make the correlation. Christ is the head of the church, the husband's the head of the wife. And he's going to do a parallel side by side between Christ and the church and the husband and the wife. So, wives, that's why you submit to your husband, because what you're doing, you're showing a picture of Christ being the head of the church. Verse number 24. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands and everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. So, husbands, you're representative of Jesus Christ's love, his undying love, his, his, his love where he is able to give his own body to save others. And think about this, to save sinners. You say, well, my wife sins against me. My, my wife is not obedient. My wife is not doing the things that she ought to be doing as a wife. Love her anyways. You haven't done all of the right things to make God happy, to make Jesus Christ happy. You've sinned against them, yet he still loved you enough to lay down his own life for you. 
Husbands, you better have that same type of love for your wife. And don't be bitter against them. You ought to be able to lay down your life for them and express that Christ-like love for your wife. That's the image that's being presented here. Verse 26, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Another aspect of loving your wife is trying to help you know, to help her get right so that she can get right with God too. You're the spiritual leader of that household. Just as Jesus works within the church to try to help us to get the sins out of our life and to do, you know, the, the right things and, and to be presented holy and unblameable and spotless. Hey, husband, that's another one of your roles is, is, in, the, in the family is, you know, you're supposed to be helping out, leading the way yourself, keeping yourself, you know, free from sin as, as much as possible, but also helping your wife out in that regard as well so that she could be presented also holy and unblameable and, and, and all these things that it mentions here because that's what Jesus does with the church. Verse 28, So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. If you're doing this, if you're loving your wife, if you're loving her so much that you're going to lay down your life, what are the odds of you now looking to another woman? to get some kind of satisfaction from her. Probably not going to happen, right? I mean, your heart's going to be set on your wife and saying, you know what? I die for my wife. I'll lay down my life for her. I love her that much. You're not going to be looking at other people. And ladies, you ought to love your husbands too. <laughs> okay, we're, we're not reading that part right now, but that's, um, that's also for you. But this is, this is the parallels that we're driving here. Look at verse number uh, 29. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife, even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. There is a spiritual application to, to our marriages. And when you commit adultery, you are completely perverting that picture. And, you know, we need to, to keep this in mind as well in our marriages that, I mean, if you're, if you're having an Ephesians 5 type of a marriage, whether you're the husband or the wife or hopefully both of you, you know, try to follow what this is laying out for you. And this adultery thing is going to take a back seat. You're not going to have to worry about it as much. Now, you're still going to need to be diligent and still going to need to be wise and still going to need to show discretion but it shouldn't be a concern. I mean, hopefully it's not a concern right now. Anyway, it's not like, oh man, we're having so many problems. I'm worried about my wife leaving me or you know, going after another man or another, you know, not another woman, but <laughs> that would be all kinds of, that's a whole other sermon. But um, let's see, the last thing I want, because I said there was two things I wanted to focus on. Okay, turn if you would to Proverbs 23. Because the last thing, we, we, we want to avoid adultery Hosea 4.6 says, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. We need to have knowledge. We need to understand um, you know, God's word, keep his instructions. We need to um, keep our hearts right with God, obviously. We need to keep your heart focused on your spouse, love your spouse, and be good to them, even if they're not doing the same in return. And that can be a hard thing to do. It can be a very difficult thing to do. I understand that. But if you want success in your marriage, that's what you, it's going to take humility from the husband and the wife. Now, husbands, I'm not saying just give up all authority because that's unbiblical. But what I'm saying is you can still be humble. You can still lead in humility. Moses was one of the, the meekest men on earth, but he was a great leader. He was still a leader in God's eyes and he still was able to do great things. Okay, and He was a very humble man. You can lead the home and still have humility. And wives, you ought to be adorned with a spirit of meekness as well. And when you're thinking about other people, you're thinking about your spouse more than you're thinking about yourself and, and your pains and discomforts and whatever, when you're more focused on the other person, that, yeah, that's going to bring out that love for them. 
set your affections and your hearts on, on them, on, on, on your spouse. Okay, obviously on God, but if, you're, if your affection's on God, then you're going to want to have a good marriage and a godly marriage at that. And um, we'll be obeying all of the scripture that we've already been looking at. Now, um, one, other, one other point, and this, is, this isn't directly like a, a verse in the Bible, but don't speak bad about your spouse to anyone. Don't ever do that. Don't speak bad, especially to family members like your own family, like, like I shouldn't be running to my mommy or my dad or my brother and, and saying like, oh man, my wife did this and my wife did that. Don't, don't do that. You are asking for a lot of problems in your marriage when you go and do that because your family is going to be like, oh yeah, you know, just like on your side. But here's the thing. You shouldn't have two sides in a marriage. There's one side. You are one flesh. You are one person. There is you, Mr. and Mrs. Tiberic, Mr. and Mrs. Adams, Mr. and Mrs. Versons. That's who we are. There's one side. There's one family. There's not split up and saying, oh, my side and her side. No, there's one. And when we're married, we need to be, to be doing our best to be diligent, not to be bad-mouthing our spouse to other people, family, no matter who it is. Because when you start... When you're speaking about that, that says, for one, you're focusing on that. Instead of focusing on maybe their good attributes or their good qualities or other things or focusing on them, you're focusing on yourself and why you're in such a, a miserable mood instead of focusing on other things that are going to be a lot more beneficial for you. But um, it's just going to drive your heart away from your spouse. So just don't do that. Now, Proverbs 23, this is the last place because, um, you know, we've had... Uh, even people in this church in the past that have had a problem with this. And I don't, I'm not saying with adultery, but when, if you get involved with alcohol, that is another very, very, very likely way for adultery to happen. Very likely way. This is, I mean, people who normally wouldn't do anything even close to committing adultery under the influence of alcohol or under the influence of drugs, they will do something like that. It, 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 it does wicked things. So you're in Proverbs 23. We're going to start reading in verse 31. We're not going to even read the whole section. In verse 31, the Bible reads, Look not thou upon the wine when it is red, when it giveth its color in the cup, when it moveth itself aright. At the last it biteth like a serpent and stingeth like an adder. Thine eyes shall behold strange women, and thine heart shall utter perverse things. When you get involved with drinking alcohol, this will, it says, thine eyes shall behold strange women. Your judgment is clouded, that drunkenness enters into you, and now you're a lot more, the flesh is winning. Your spirit is very weak when you add other spirits, as they're called, the alcohol, wine, and spirits, right? You add a different spirit into your body. Your, the Holy Spirit is going to be weak. Your flesh is going to be strong and you are just going to be feeding that flesh and your, your eyes are not going to have, you, you don't have that discretion. The discretion's gone. Your inhibitions start to go out the window. Your judgment gets clouded and your heart is going to utter perverse things. It happens. It's, I mean, this is like a mathematical equation. You have you, you add alcohol to it. What's the result? What does that equal? perverse thoughts your eyes looking on strange women that's what happens that's a fact that's what the bible says and that is a fact ask anyone who has the experience and knowledge in this area they'll tell you that's a fact i'll tell you that's a fact but you don't even have to go based off of experience you go based off of the word of god go off of proverbs go off of that wisdom and you know, I, I don't think anyone in here has a problem with alcohol, but hey, you never know what could happen down the road. Um, you know, hopefully no one ever turns to that or, or you know, has such a, a bad time in their life that they, they turn to that. That is going to compound your problems more than anything. And like the, you know, a person I'm thinking of that, that at one point had become in this church, this was, alcohol is the source of their problem. I guarantee you that. They have problems with their, you know, the spouses have problems with each other. You know, they, they, they weren't really coming to church that much and, you know, not, not too consistently. And alcohol, I believe, is at the root of their problems. Alcohol destroys lives. 
And like I said, I don't know anything. I, I mean, I don't think there's any adultery going on, but I don't know that. I mean, alcohol is going to lead to that. You start having fights and problems with your spouse, and then you add alcohol, those fights are going to get even worse, and you're going to start looking on strange women. Before you know it, adultery is in the situation. And like I said, that is something that there's no cure for that. God prescribed the death penalty for a reason. There, there's no making that right. Let's bow our heads in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for your words of instruction. God, we love you, and I know that we love our spouses, dear Lord. Help us to, to continue to do what's right. Help us to stay on the right path. Help us to set up boundaries in our lives, dear Lord. Help us to keep a discreet relationship with our friends and to just set up wise rules for ourselves that... Um, you know, other people might look at us and think we're weird, but you know what? We're going to be guarded. We're going to be uh, making sure that, that our vows hold true and that we have a great relationship with our spouses, dear Lord. Help us to increase our wisdom and our knowledge in this area, dear Lord. And I pray that you please bless all of our marriages. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.